Hi, I'm so happy you've joined me for another video looking at um, reading a book with me, so let's get to it. The third book in this series is The Tailor of Gloucester by Beatrice Potter. Can you tell me what animals you can see in the picture? Well, on the top left hand corner, right over there, we have a hedgehog. And then we have one mouse, a second mouse and a third mouse. So three mice as well. We have a goose with her bonnet on and we have a toad a squirrel, an owl, and then we have one, two, three, four rabbits, and then Tom Kitten. So those are the little animals I can see. And we have different items in the middle. We have a pie on the bottom corner. We have a cup and a teapot as well, so for afternoon tea. And it looks like we have a package. And then on the top left hand in the middle, we have maybe bread and chicken. I'm not sure exactly what, but some food items. Is there anything else you can see that I've not mentioned in this picture? And you can see that they're wearing clothes from the Victorian era as well. So she's got a beautiful dress, which is very big. Um, and he is wearing a traditional outfit as well. So it's very formal and they look like they're at a ball. My dear Freda, because you are fond of fairy tales and have been ill, I have made you a story all for yourself, a new one that nobody has read before. And the queerest thing about it is that I heard it in Gloucestershire and that it is true, at least about the tailor, the waistcoat and the no more twist. Christmas 1901. And you see this word queerest. Well, um, if something's queer, it means the weirdest thing, the most unusual thing, the unique thing is. So it's another way to say that. Here you can see a picture of a tailor, an old tailor man, and a tailor is someone whose job it is to make fitted clothes. So those can be suits, it could be trousers, it could be jackets, etc. The Tailor of Gloucester. In the time of swords and periwigs and full-skirted coats with flowered lappets, when gentlemen wore ruffles and gold-laced waistcoats of powder soy, and taffeta. There lived a tailor in Gloucester. He sat in the window of a little shop in Westgate Street, cross-legged on a table from morning till dark. All day long, while the light lasted, he sewed and snippeted, piercing out his satin pompadour and lustering. Stuffs had strange names and were very expensive in the days of the tailor of Gloucester. So, pedulsoy and taffeta are different types of fabric, and the pompadour is a type of hairstyle as well. So, um, old words um, that we, you won't really see that often or to be used that often. And a ruffle is when material is gathered together to make into like a frill. So, it's, you have a ruffled dress and um, it's very beautiful and it's not simple, it's more extravagant. But although he sewed fine silk for his neighbours, he himself was very, very poor. A little old man in spectacles with a pinched face, old crooked fingers and a suit of threadbare clothes. He cut his coats without waste according to his embroidered cloth. There were very small ends and snippets that lay about upon the table. Two narrow breaths for nout, except waistcoats for mice, said the tailor. 
One bitter cold day, near Christmas time, the tailor began to make a coat, a coat of cherry-coloured corded silk embroidered with pansies and roses and a cream-coloured satin waistcoat trimmed with gauze and green. So spectacles is another term for glasses. So glasses for you to see. And if you have a pinched face, it means that it's tight and um, with maybe cold and pale or with hunger. So that's when something's pinched, especially a face. And a pansy is a type of flower. So it's embroidered with um, pansies and roses. And when they says for naught or for now, it depends on your accent, it means for nothing. Worst of chenille for the male of Gloucester. The tailor worked and worked and he talked to himself. He measured the silk and turned it round and round and trimmed it into shape with his shears. The table was all littered with cherry coloured snippets. No breath at all and cut on the cross. It is no breath at all. Tippets for mice and ribbons for mobs, for mice, said the tailor of Gloucester. For when the snowflakes came down against the small leaded window panes and shut out the light, the tailor had done his day's work. All the silk and satin lay cut out upon the table. There were 12 pieces for the... So quickly to go through a couple of words before we continue on. Chenille is a type of fabric. If... If you trim something, it means that you cut it to tidy it up. So, for example, you could have a hair trim, which means that you're cutting the ends of your hair so that it's straight. So you're not cutting a huge amount and doing a whole new look, but you're just trimming the ends. And shears look like scissors, but they're heavier and they're bigger, um, and they're used specifically by tailors or seamstresses, people who work with clothes and cutting up fabric. There were 12 pieces for the coat and four pieces for the waistcoat and there were pocket flaps and cuffs and buttons all in order. For the lining of the coat, there was fine yellow taffeta and for the buttonholes of the waistcoat, there was cherry coloured twist and everything was ready to sew together in the morning, all measured and sufficient, except that there was wanting just one single skein of cherry coloured twisted silk. The tailor came out of his shop at dark, for he did not sleep there at night. He fastened the window and locked the door and took away the key. No one lived there at night but little brown mice, and they run in and out without any keys. So, skein is um, a th yarn, so a length of threaded yarn, or could be knotted or loose or coiled. And I love the picture of the tailor leaving his shop with the clothes laid out. For behind the wooden wainscots of all the old houses in Gloucester, there are little mouse staircases and secret trap doors, and the mice run from house to house through the long, narrow passages. They can run all over the town without going into the streets. But the tailor came out of his shop and shuffled home through the snow. He lived quite nearby in the college court, next the doorway to College Green. And although it was not a big house, the tailor was so poor, he only rented the kitchen. He lived alone with his cat. It was called Simpkin. Now all day long, while the tailor was out at work, Simpkin kept the house. So a wainscot is the wooden panelling that is on, um, runs along the wall um, in a room, and it's the lower part of that as well. And if you shuffle home, it's um, to shuffle is to a way that you drag your feet. So you're walking, but you're dragging your feet as well. Um, and I love the fact his name is called Simpkin. Do you like that name? Simpkin kept house by himself, and he also was fond of the mice, though he gave them no satin for coats. Meow, said the cat when the tailor opened the door. Meow. The tailor replied, Simpkin, we shall make our fortune, but I am worn to a ravelling. Take this groat, 
which is our last four pence, and Simkin, take a china pimpkin, buy a pennant for bread, a pennant for milk, and a pennant for sausages. And oh, Simkin, with the last penny of our four pence, buy me one pennant of cherry coloured silk. But do not lose the last penny of the four pence, Simkin, or I am undone and worn to a thread paper, for I have no more twist. A penny of um, is another way to say a penny worth. So like one penny is worth. Um, so they're spending one penny on bread, one penny on milk, one penny on sausages, and one penny on this um, cherry-coloured silk. And when he says no more twist, well, twist is like the yarn. It's what we, they, he uses to sew or to stitch. And I'm always curious, because I had a look, being like, what? A groat? You know, a groat is old money, and it's worth four, four pence. And... But what is that value from in the 1900s to today's money? So 4p there, 4 pence in that time, would be around £5 pounds in today's money. Well, maybe more, actually, um, a little more. But £5, pounds, £5.50 pounds in today's money, and that's around $6, American dollars, or €6. Euros. Then Simpkin again said, meow, and took the groat and the pipkin and went out into the dark. The tailor was very tired and beginning to be ill. He sat down by the hearth and taught himself about that wonderful coat. I shall make my fortune to be cut by us. The mayor of Gloucester is to be married on Christmas Day in the morning, and he had ordered a coat and an embroidered waistcoat to be lined with yellow taffeta, and the taffeta suffice there is no more left over in snippets. They will, will serve to make tippets for mice. Then the tailor started for suddenly interrupting him from the... So the word that we saw before, pipkin, it's a kind of pot or pan. And sophia is an old term for to suffice. Okay, so S-U-F-F-I-C-E without that T-H. Um is just another way to say it, but um, actually to suffice, um, to be sufficient enough, to be enough, we use that more commonly now, and I'd be surprised if you hear the old way of saying it. From the dresser at the other side of the kitchen came a number of little noises, tip-tap, 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 tip. Now what can that be? said the tailor of Gloucester, jumping up from his chair. The dresser was covered with crockery and pipkins, willow pattern plates and teacups and mugs. The tailor crossed the kitchen and stood quite still beside the dresser, listening and peering through his spectacles. Again from under a teacup came those funny little noises. Tip-tap, 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 tip. This is very peculiar, said the tailor of Gloucester, and he lifted up the teacup, which was upside down. So peering is to look, to peer, and we have peculiar. Peculiar is strange or weird. How peculiar. Out stepped a little live lady mouse and made a curtsy to the tailor. Then she hopped away down off the dresser and under the waistcoat. The tailor sat down again by the fire, warming his poor cold hands, and mumbling to himself. The waistcoat is cut out from peach-coloured satin, tambour stitch and rosebuds in beautiful floss silk. Was I wise to entrust my last four pence to Simpkin? One in twenty buttonholes of cherry-coloured twist. But all at once from the dresser, there came other little noises. Tip-tap, 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 tip. This is passing extraordinary, said the tailor of Gloucester. So, when you mumble to yourself, you talk to yourself like very low, in a very quiet voice, and mumbling to yourself. To entrust means to give responsibility to someone. So, he's saying, should I have entrusted Simkin with my last money? And 
If you think about any task or things you have to do in your life, who do you trust? Who are the people that you can entrust to do things? And we can see on the picture that the little mouse is curtsying to the tailor. So she is bowing down. It's a sign of respect. And turned over another teacup, which was upside down. Out stepped a little gentleman mouse and made a bow to the tailor. And then from all over the dresser came a chorus of little tappings, all sounding together and answering one another like watch beetles in an old worm-eaten window shutter. Tip tap, tip tap, tip tap, tip. And from under teacups and from under bowls and basins stepped other and more little mice who hopped away down off the dresser and under the wainscot. The tailor sat down, close over the fire, lamenting. One and twenty buttonholes of cherry-coloured silk. And to lament is to express um, disappointment or regret about something. So it's thinking about something but that bothers you. To be finished by noon of Saturday... And this is Tuesday evening. Was it right to let loose those mice? Undoubtedly, the property of Simpkin. Alack, I am undone, for I have no more twist. The little mice came out again and listened to the tailor. They took notice of the pattern of that wonderful coat. They whispered to one another about the taffeta lining and about little mouse tippets. And then all at once, they all ran away together down the passage behind the wainscot squeaking and calling to one another as they ran from house to house and that one mouse was left in the tailor's kitchen. A squeak is a high-pitched cry or sound. That's a squeak, so you generally hear my squeaking as well, so how they communicate. And he's saying it's Tuesday evening, so how many days... If it has to be finished by Saturday at noon, does he have to finish the coat? So he has a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and maybe Saturday morning. So three and a half days he has to finish the coat because in the evening is at night and at noon is 12 o'clock midday. When Simpkin came back with a pipkin of milk, Simpkin opened the door and bounced in with an angry meow, like a cat that is vexed, for he hated the snow, and there was snow in his ears and snow in his collar at the back of his neck. He put down the loaf and the sausages upon the dresser and sniffed. Simpkin, said the tailor, where is my twist? But Simpkin set down the pipkin of milk upon the dresser and looked suspiciously at the teacups. He wanted his supper of little fat mouse. Simpkin, said the tailor, where is my twist? And vexed is to be frustrated or irritated as well. So let's see what happens between the tailor and Simpkin, because I think if Simpkin's hungry, he's not going to be happy. But Simpkin hid a little parcel privately in the teapot and spit and growled at the tailor. And if Simpkin had been able to talk, he would have asked, where is my mouse? Alack, I'm undone, said the tailor of Gloucester, and went sadly to bed. All that night long, Simpkin hunted and searched through the kitchen, peeping into cupboards and under the wainscot, and into the teapot where he'd hidden that twist. But still he found never a mouse. Whenever the tailor muttered and talked in his sleep, Simpkin said, and made strange, horrid noises, as cats do at night. For the poor old tailor was very ill with a fever, tossing and turning in his four-post bed, and still in his dreams he mumbled, no more twist, no more twist. All that day he was ill, and the next day, and the next. And what should become of the cherry-coloured coat in the tailor's shop in Westgate Street, the embroidered silk and satin lay cut out upon a table, one and twenty buttonholes, and who should come to sew them when the window was barred and the door was fast locked? But that does not hinder the little brown mice 
they run in and out without any keys through all the old houses in Gloucester. A fever is when you're not well and you have a really high temperature, so you feel hot. Um, and to hinder um, means to stop. So that doesn't hinder, that doesn't stop the little brown mice. Out of doors, the market folks went trudging through the snow to buy their geese and turkeys and to bake their Christmas pies. But there would be no Christmas dinner for Simpkin and the poor old tailor of Gloucester. The tailor lay ill for three days and nights, and then it was Christmas Eve, and very late at night, the moon climbed up over the roofs and chimneys and looked down over the gateway into College Court. There was no lights in the windows, nor any sound in the houses. All the city of Gloucester was fast asleep under the snow. And still Simpkin wanted his mice and mewed as he stood beside the four-post bed. So the word folks is an informal way to say people. And trudging is when you have to walk, but... Um, through something difficult, so through snow or through sand, and you take heavy footsteps. But it is in the old story that all the beasts can talk in the night between Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. In the morning, though there are very few folk that can hear them or know what it is that they say, when the cathedral clock struck 12, there was an answer, like an echo of the chimes, and Simpkin heard it and came out of the tailor's door and wandered about in the snow. From all the roofs and gables and old one and houses in Gloucester came a thousand merry voices singing the old Christmas rhymes and all the old songs that ever I heard of, and some that I don't know, like Whittakin's Bell. So Christmas Eve is not specifically for um, the evening before Christmas Day, it could be the whole day. We call it the 24th of December Christmas Eve, then Christmas Day, and then on the 26th of December, we call that Boxing Day. And an echo is a sound that is like reflected again, um, and you hear it again. So if you're in a cave and you say, hello, you might hear, hello, 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 back. So the sound has been echoed back. If something is merry, it's cheerful, or it's lively, or it's happy. So that's why we have a Merry Christmas. First and loudest, the cocks cried out, Dame, get up and bake your pies. Oh, dilly, 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 sighed Simpkin. And now in a garret there were lights and sounds of dancing, and cats came from over the way. Hey, diddle, diddle, the cat and the fiddle, all the cats of Gloucester, except me, said Simpkin. Under the wooden eaves, the starlings and sparrows sang of Christmas pies. The jackdaws woke up in the cathedral tower, and although it was the middle of the night, the fossils and robins sang. The air was quite full of little twittering tunes. So a garret is the top floor or the attic room. As well as it's right at the top, we have the eaves. So the eaves is... Um, the part of the roof that overhangs on a building. And the last one that I wanted to talk about was twittering. It's like the little sound that birds make. They tweet, tweet, and they twitter together. And that's why before we used to have the um, social app called Twitter because, and they had the picture of the bird because birds would tweet or they would twitter. They would communicate that way together. But it was all rather provoking to poor hungry Simpkin. Particularly he was vexed with some little shrill voices from behind a wooden lattice. I think that they were bats because they always have very small voices, especially in a black frost when they talk in their sleep, like the tailor of Gloucester. They said something mysterious that sounded like, buzz quoth the blue fly, hum quoth the bee. Buzz and hum they cry, and so do we. And Simpkin went away, shaking his ears, as, a, as if he had a bee in his bonnet. From the tailor's shop in Westgate came a glow of light. And when Simpkin crept up to the peeping at the window, okay, and you can see in the picture of Simpkin wandering around through the snow on Christmas Eve. 
the word the word provoking is to be causing annoyance or irritation a shrill voice is a high-pitched piercing voice and it's shrill um, and you might know people who speak quite shrilly Quoth is a archaic, informal way of saying said. So, Buzz said the blue fly. And a bee in his bonnet, or a bee in your bonnet, is to talk or to think a lot about something. So, if something, you have a bee in your bonnet about something, it means it's on your mind. It was full of candles, there was a snippeting of scissors and snappeting of thread. And little mouse voices sang loudly and gaily. Four and twenty sailors went to catch a snail. The best man amongst them durst not touch her tail. She put out her horns like a little kylo cow. Run, tailors, run. Oh, she'll have you all up, even now. Then without a pause, the little mouse voices went on again. Sieve my lady's oatmeal. Grind my lady's flour. Put it in a chestnut. Let it stand an hour. Mew, mew, interrupted Sipkin, and he scratched at the door. I quite like the little songs of the mice. And four and twenty, we have, um, it's an older way of saying 24. So now we say that 20 and then four, but before 100 years ago or more, they used to say four and twenty, one and twenty, one and thirty. A kylo cow is a type of Scottish cow. They're really cute. They're not like the black and white ones. They're shaggy. They have like lots of long hair um, and they, they look adorable. So have a look at a picture of what one looks like. But you can see them all sewing together. And how many mice can you see in the picture working together? There's one, two, three, four, five mice that you can see. And what else is in the picture that I've not mentioned? Right in the centre, you've got that candle and you've got the fabric as well around them. But the key was under the tailor's pillow. He could not get in. The little mice only laughed and tried another tune. Three little mice sat down to spin. Pussy passed by and she peeped in. Where are you at, my fine little men? making coats for gentlemen. Shall I come in and cut off your threads? Oh no, Miss Pussy, you'd bite off our heads. Mew, mew, cried Simpkin. Hey, diddle dinkity, answered the little mice. Hey, little dink, hey, diddle dinkity, poppity pet. The merchants of London, they wear scarlet, silk in the collar and gold in the hem. So merrily marched the merchant men. They clinked their thimbles to mark the time, but none of the songs pleased. So thimbles are little things that you put on the end of your finger, um, maybe metal, but it stops when you're sewing, it stops the needles pricking you. So it's a way to protect yourself. And if you've ever played Monopoly, the board game, you know that one of the items, they have like a car, I think they have a boat, they have a iron, but they also have a thimble as well. Um, so that's what a thimble is. Let's see what happens next. But none of the songs pleased Simpkin. He sniffed and mewed at the door of the shop. And then I bought a pipkin and a popkin, a slipkin and a slopkin, all for one farthing. And upon the kitchen dresser added the rude little mice. Mew, scratch, scratch, scuffled Simpkin on the windowsill, while the little mice inside sprang to their feet and all began to shout at once in little twittering voices, no more twist, no more twist, and they barred up the window shutters and shut out Simpkin. But still, through the nicks in the shutters, he could hear the click. Springing up is to jump up suddenly and sprang is the past tense to spring. And can you describe to me what you see in this picture? And let me know, what do you think? Do you think the mice are a little bit rude or do you are a little cheeky? I don't know. He could hear the click of thimbles and little mouse voices singing, no more twist, no more twist. 
Simpkin came away from the shop and went home, considering in his mind, he found the poor old tailor without fever, sleeping peacefully. Then Simpkin went on tiptoe and took a little parcel of silk out of the teapot and looked at it in the moonlight. And he felt quite ashamed of his badness compared with those good little mice. When the tailor awoke in the morning, the first thing which he saw upon the patchwork quilt was a skein of cherry-coloured twist silk, twisted silk, and beside his bed stood the repentant Simpkin. To be repentant is to have remorse or regret, and I think it's always really important to be able to think back over your actions, and you don't have to think in that same moment. So it's good that Simkin was angry because he'd lost some of his dinner, but he was able to think, okay, maybe I didn't behave in the best way. Alack, I am worn to a raveling, said the tailor of Gloucester, but I have my twist. The sun was shining on the snow when the tailor got up and dressed and came out into the street with Simkin running behind before him. The starlings whistled on the chimney stacks and the fossils and robins sang, but they sang their own little noises, not the words they had sung in the night. Alack, said the tailor, I have my twist, but no more strength nor time than will serve to make me one single buttonhole, for this is Christmas Day in the morning. The Mayor of Gloucester shall be married at noon. A lack is an archaic way to say, oh no, to express dismay. A whistle is a high-pitched noise that you make by blowing out air through your mouth, um, like a small hole for your mouth or your teeth. So, that's a whistle. And um, can you whistle as well? Some people can also whistle by putting two fingers in their mouth and they can blow out a really loud pitch sound. I can't do that one, but I can do the one where <whistles> that one. <laughs> How about you? And if not, you can start practicing. Married by noon. And where is his cherry colored coat? He unlocked the door of the little shop in Westgate Street and Simpkin ran in like a cat that expects something. But there was no one there. Not even one little brown mouse. The boards were swept and clean, and the little ends of thread and little silk snippets were all tidied away and gone from off the floor. But upon the table, oh joy, the tailor gave a shout. There, where he had left plain cuttings of silk, there lay the most beautifulest coat, an embroidered satin waistcoat that ever were worn by a mayor of Gloucester. Oh, what great news for the tailor. And you see this word beautifulest. Wow, beautifulest is not a word we use anymore. Um, we would say the most beautiful coat because it's a superlative. So we can say, um, for example, you can say high, higher, highest. But with beautiful, you can say beautiful, more beautiful, most beautiful. So we use most in front and then the adjective afterwards. There were roses and pansies upon the facings of the coat, and the waistcoat was worked with poppies and cornflowers. Everything was finished except just one single cherry-coloured buttonhole, and where that buttonhole was wanting, there was a pin, a scrap of paper, with these words in little teeny weeny writing. No more twist. And from then began the look of the tailor of Gloucester. He grew quite stout and he grew quite rich. He made the most wonderful waistcoats for all the rich merchants of Gloucester and for all the fine gentlemen of the country round. So teeny weeny is incredibly small. So it's just another fun way of saying tiny. And stout is a polite way of saying fat or round so if you he's stout so he's eating well and he's living happy compared to before when he had not much money for food never were seen such ruffles or such embroidered cuffs and lappets but his buttonholes were the greatest triumph of it all 
The stitches of these buttonholes were so neat, so neat. I wonder how they could be stitched by an old man in spectacles with crooked old fingers and a tailor's thimble. The stitches of those buttonholes were so small, so small, they looked as if they had been made by little mice. The end. I hope you enjoyed this book. Um, can you tell me about a time when bad fortune became good, so you got lucky? And I'll see you for the next reading. Bye.